There's few things we love more in America than fabulously successful entrepreneurs. And made Holmes the world's youngest female self-made billionaire. Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, and Elon Musk are every bit as famous and admired as Brad Pitt, LeBron, or Beyonce. Titans of industry are celebrated and obsessed over. Self-made entrepreneurs personify the American dream. But is that actually true or good? There's this myth that th these people are self-made and we should leave them alone. It's a dangerous myth. Tied up in the way we talk about wealth and success in America are broader indictments of its society and one of the foundations on which it's built. In the U.S., we like to make up stories to explain why some people succeed and others fail. And one of the biggest myths in the U.S. is that individual success or failure is based on what you can control and do in terms of your actions. Nobody is self-made. But it's not something I think we can dispense with either entirely uh, because the American dream endows people with a sense of agency, with a sense of possibility. And that is very empowering. This is Think Again with me, Andrew Stern, where I take you every step of the way as I dig into compelling, complex or controversial topics that make us wonder, do we need to think again? All right, to begin, we have to keep up with some Kardashians because it was a particular magazine cover that sent me on this path. Yep, that's the one. Back in March, Forbes crowned Kylie Jenner, then 21, the youngest self-made billionaire ever, which struck me as confusing at best. I mean, how can Forbes pronounce a woman self-made when her family had its own TV show, hundreds of millions of collective social media followers, and hundreds of millions of dollars at their disposal before she set any business plans in motion? And at a deeper level, is anyone ever really and truly self-made? That particular question has nagged at me for years because the hustle all the time mentality many famous entrepreneurs preach can be quite toxic. I talk to 20-year-old entrepreneurs, they don't work on weekends. You know, I worked every Saturday of my 20s. It becomes especially problematic because the way we talk about wealth and success in this country and who's responsible for each has major implications for how we think, how we vote, and how we live. So to better understand how that happens and why it matters, I flew to Boston to speak with Mike Lapham, head of the Responsible Wealth Project and co-author of the book, The Self-Made Myth. You know, it's fine Good. to idolize entrepreneurs and put them on a pedestal and, and um, you know, glorify the entrepreneur. They, they, um, they should be, you know, they, they work hard, they take risks. The problem is that if you believe that it's just that one person who creates the business, who creates the wealth, uh, then you leave a lot out of the picture. You said the, the concept of being self-made, like the self-made myth that is a dangerous myth. What makes that dangerous? If you believe that uh, these businesses succeed, and these entre entrepreneurs succeed all on their own, um, and it's just their grit and hard work that creates the success, then there's implications for what does that mean for people who aren't successful. And we, we then say that, oh, if you're, if you're poor, then it's because you, you didn't work hard enough. There's a lot of other people working hard who are, who are not getting by. Lapham frames most of his analysis through practical lenses, not economic theory so much, but rather how the self-made myth affects things like our taxes or infrastructure priorities. The other implication is that if you believe that government is in the way, you're gonna say, oh, we should lower taxes on businesses, we should lower taxes on wealthy individuals, and we should leave them alone um, and get government off their backs. As a relevant aside, Lapham's personal story involves inheriting family wealth Yet he chooses to lead a group of wealthy individuals advocating for the government to quite literally tax them more. Rather than succeeding despite government, we argue in the book that these businesses succeed because of what government does, because of the investment that government makes in uh, public education, in infrastructure, in courts and patents and laws, and you know, they rely on publicly educated employees, all the things that make it possible to build a business and, and grow it and, and keep your wealth. All right, I think it's pretty easy to see how calling someone self-made leaves important public contributions out of the picture. It can also warp our federal or state spending priorities and tax policies. But does the specific terminology really matter? I mean, at a certain level, the media has to choose some term to delineate between earned wealth and inherited wealth, right? So why not self-made? To see how this term and the concepts wrapped up in it impacts more than just tax policy, 
I scurried across Boston to UMass Boston to speak with Banuas Kazank Pan. I'm an associate professor of management at the College of Management at UMass Boston. Meritocracy is this idea that depending on what you put in, what you get out is just and right. But what we know is that's not the case. So when you say the American myth of meritocracy, how are you defining meritocracy? What falls within the confines of that um, phenomenon? I think America has its own version of meritocracy that's very much built in a particular version of American history that ignores the ways in which this nation was built by slaves and immigrants. The myth of meritocracy assumes we all start at the same place. And that is the fundamental lie, isn't it? That is the fundamentally made up part of the story is we do not all start at the same place. There are structures in place that may or may not be visible to everyone that actually continue to benefit certain kinds of people. In entrepreneurship, that tends to be the younger white male. Now what happens when we keep repeating that hero entrepreneur myth is that we believe that is the only way to be an entrepreneur and that is the definition of success when in reality we miss out on the fact that it wasn't just a couple of guys in their garage, but there was a whole system in place that supported them, including funding and networks. A lot of Oscar Zank Pond's research focuses on how that access to funding and those networks, which are crucial to entrepreneurship, systemically sidesteps female entrepreneurs. The funding allotted to women-founded startups is somewhere between 3 and 7%. This number hasn't budged in decades. So according to Oscar Zank Pond, Framing success and wealth through a self-made lens builds into a toxic myth of meritocracy. And those two myths impact much more than just high-level tax policy. They have individual and collective psychological consequences. They stifle entrepreneurship, which is the engine of the American economy. And ultimately, they contribute to income inequality and the policies that exacerbate it. What we're seeing now is people pushing back to say that narrative was really never true. And if it was true, Maybe it was for only certain groups of people. So why have the self-made myth and the myth of meritocracy persisted then? Turns out it has something to do with the larger concept of the American dream. To discuss that historical context, I went to Hastings on Hudson, just north of the Bronx, to chat with Jim Cullen. I'm a history teacher at the Ethical Culture of Fieldston School in New York. I'm the author of about 15 books, mostly uh, cultural history. Um, and uh, my probably most important book is A History of the American Dream. It is, at bottom, a religious concept, and, uh, and it's one that's rooted in the Protestant Reformation. The notion that the individual has the, the power and ability to uh, discern um, one's own relationship to God, which is to say one's own relationship to reality. Related to that idea, is this notion of improvability that if you that if you know if you can understand your relationship to God if you can understand your place in the world you can change it you can improve it this was a very very powerful idea with lots of different manifestations this idea percolated through America's history and has taken different forms throughout the decades but it took on a specific popularity and meaning in 1931 thanks to a guy named James Trunslow Adams it has framed the way we talk about economic policy and personal success ever since. There's this collective desire for self-actualization uh, that is rooted in a shared culture. I mean, that, that, that is the dream at its most vibrant. You know, there, there are not a lot of societies that are predicated on that. You know, they're, they're about knowing your place. They're about being in this together. But there's a weird paradox where, where we are collectively um, uh, engaged in individual aspiration. Um, and that is really quite remarkable. There's another side to that, though, one I hadn't really thought about until I saw it on the West Wing during a debate about the estate tax, and the quote has stayed with me for years. It doesn't matter if most voters don't benefit. They all believe that someday they will. That's the problem with the American dream. It makes everyone concerned for the day they're going to be rich. That, of course, is, is true, you know, um, th that... Um, that people, you know, nurture these hopes that are, that by definition are at best um, questionable and, and, you know, at worst highly unlikely, if, if, if not impossible. You realize that there is a, 
uh, potential, if not actual, cruelty uh, at the heart of the American dream. It's some very uh, empirical way, no, nobody is self-made. But it's not something I think we can dispense with either, um, ent entirely. Uh, because um, we need to believe that we have some power over our own lives. We need to believe that we get some credit for what we accomplish. If we throw all of that out, psychologically it's very difficult to function. All right, so the American dream maybe isn't all bad? Like I said, I got into this story because the self-made terminology we often use to describe success seemed off to me. After speaking with Lapham and Oscar Zengpan, it's clear we probably shouldn't be referring to entrepreneurs like Kylie Jenner as self-made anythings, because for one, they're simply not. And two, framing issues using that terminology, as well as with the related concept of meritocracy, can influence major policy decisions and potentially harm folks' lives. But even though there might be a cruel contradiction at the heart of the American dream, it just might be worth preserving. The history of the United States tells a much more complex and varied story than people overcoming barriers and becoming successful um, as individuals. When there are communities that have worked together for centuries to make this place what it is. These days, the stock of the American dream is down. Uh, people are much more aware of its limits, um, of its cruelties, and um, you know there are some very good reasons for that, rooted in you know political circumstances, our economic you know uh, position, and so on. Um, but I I I think we would be um, foolish, or or it would be dangerous to dispense with it entirely, or write it off simply as a lie. I mean I I do think that it is at, you know, at this point in our history. The, the most important form of social stitching that, that's holding us together. We don't agree on very many things these days. And, um, and you know, our willingness to recognize and affirm each other's aspirations is, uh, is an invaluable um, resource for, for any society. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.